Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, just a few announcements before we start. Um, if you missed the alt slash non-academic career panel that happened uh, last week, that is posted on our YouTube channel, so go ahead and check that out. Um, we'll be meeting next week on Friday, August 20th at 11 a.m. Um, and we'll be talking about applying for academic jobs. And um, we'll be circulating a form soon um, if you have any uh, thoughts or questions that you want to be included in that um, session. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. But today we are excited to have um, Henri here as an organizer and a speaker for this symposium. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand it over to her. Thank you so much. There we go. I hope you can see me and that you can hear me. There we go. So thank you everyone for joining us today and for listening to our presentation of the symposium. Um, we are four um, colleagues from the, uh, the University of Johannesburg in South Africa. And we will be sharing the symposium with you today. Let's see if I can share my screen. Um, I see Alexa, unfortunately it says, host disabled participant screen sharing. Is there perhaps a way you can just enable us to share um, our screens? Yes, let me hang up one second. Thank you. I'm going to have to leave real quick, but I'll be right back on, okay? That's fine. Thank you. So I'm Elizabeth Henning. I work with Henri, and I was wondering whether we should just continue with your introduction, Henri, or whether you want me to continue. Uh, that's fine. I was just um, perhaps waiting for Alexa so that she can... Um, enable our um, screen sharing, but maybe um, in the meantime, I can just say our symposium is about the interplay of vocabulary reading competence and early number concept development, um, linguistic perspectives on early numeracy in South Africa. Um, and yes, this is Professor Henan. And um, thank you, um, Alvi, as we call her, Professor Henan. Um, you can maybe introduce us and um, then hopefully when Alexa comes back, we can see if we can share our screens. Thank you and hello everybody. I have the privilege of having been involved with um, people who were my students at some point, some graduate students. Dr. Henri Besaidno being the first one that I mentioned. She is now a postdoc fellow uh, and she is sponsored by, by the University of Johannesburg in a very special program uh, which is 4IR related. And um, with her is uh, Figili Similani, who is a lecturer in the Department of Childhood Education at our university Soweto campus. She is currently completing her doctorate on early reading, but before that, she did a master's study and she investigated how teachers were able to help children who, with mathematical difficulties and because of her language background, she saw uh, the teacher's reactions from a very specific point of view. And then we come to the final person in this meeting, which is Ayanda Dlamini. Ayanda is also uh, in our group. He teaches at the Funda Ujabule School, and he can tell you more about that when it's his turn. It's a school based on our campus. It's a public school, but it is also a lab school for the university's teacher education. And his study is uh, also a very interesting one for me. As his supervisor, uh, he, he tested a couple of kids, a whole lot, he'll tell you how many, on uh, the reading of word problems. And he has a very specific angle because uh, he did not test them on individual items with different problems, but one reading passage, which he then analyzed afterwards uh, for their performance, but also did some interviews with some of the children who were involved. 
So if Alexa isn't back yet, um, we we wait. Oh, I think we okay? should be good. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. great. Okay, so then I can go there. Thank you very much. Um, mm -hmm. My screen should come up. Are you okay with that? Not yet. Um, maybe Not we yet. Should okay, I, I guess it's coming. Is it visible yet? Not yet. Okay, great. Okay, so. Oh, not yet. We, sorry, let's, we can't see it yet. Well, the first uh, slide is simply uh, a printed version of, or a written version of what I just told you. And you can just tell me when you can see it. Can you, um, are you sharing your screen right now? Yeah, I am. Do you want to stop it and then see and try it again? Okay, I'll do that again. Thank you. That's the way it goes in our virtual lives these yeah. days. Mm -hmm. oh, not yet. Not yet. Nope. Henri, can you try sharing your screen too, just to make sure that it's working? Yeah, I think it is working. It is, okay. Okay, we see Henri's. So you can see my screen if I share it? Correct. Yes, we see you. Thank you. Okay. So I must just go in and out, but I wonder if that's necessary. I can come in at the end so that we can use this time purposefully. Henri, if you want to begin with your presentation, you can do so. Um, yeah, you, you make the decision. Um, yes, that's fine. I can start so long. Is that fine? Um, is that fine? Yeah, that, that's fine with me. Let me just go to presenter mode. There we go. Okay. I will just switch on my camera. There we go. Um, so I'll... Um, our symposium, as I said, is about the interplay of um, vocabulary. Sorry, just excuse me for one second, please. Sorry about that. <laughs> Let's continue. About the interplay of vocabulary, reading, competence, and early number concept development. And we will give a linguistic perspective on early numeracy in South Africa. Um, so Professor Henning will um, provide some background um, when, when she is ready to share her screen. But for now, my, my, my study, which is part of the symposium, is about a mathematics-specific vocabulary assessment um, that is used to assess number talk, as we also read about it in the literature, um, of early grade children. So in South Africa, um, we have a interesting, um, we have something interesting, but I think if this is not unique to South Africa, we see it in many other countries as well, where children learn in English. And English is often not a language with which they are familiar with. Professor Henning will explain um, about how we, how we used this in the classes and that they take um, there are quite a few uh, um, code switching going on in the classes. So the, the teachers will switch between English and the language that the child um, understands. So mathematics specific vocabulary, as I mentioned, is also referred to as number talk in the literature or math related vocabulary. And these include words like more, few, before, in between, big or small. And all of these words are interwoven in explanations and instructions um, by teachers who introduce children to the words. 
that are prominent in discussion and in thinking about number and magnitude. So when I designed a test to assess what are the words that young children know and what are the words that they are yet to learn, um, I, just, I, I divided the words into three categories. And all of these words are prerequisites to numerical learning. And as most other learning as well, um, learning numeracy is dependent on language to some extent. Um, if I was to ask a child, what comes just before five? And the child doesn't know the meaning of the word before, he or she won't be able to answer my question, not because that child doesn't have the conceptual understanding of the principle or the construct before, but perhaps he or she just doesn't know the meaning of the word. So the three categories are numerical language qualifiers, comparative language and spatial language. Numerical language qualifiers refer to words like many, just as many, few, small, more. Um, and then also comparative language, same size, tall, bigger, shortest, tallest, smallest, biggest, short, big. And then spatial language like words um, such as in between, above, first, under, last, after, on top of, in front of, and behind. So these words are all assessed um, by the test. And the test, I will refer, I'll show you a little bit later, but the test is called the Meerkat Maths Language Test. I will give some background where, where this Meerkat cam, comes from, but each word is an individual item. So we will ask the child um, a question about many, same size, tall, in between, and so forth. So in the literature, um, we see that there are many researchers such as Jinkman Golden Meadow or Levine and Belagian, I, I hope I pronounce her surname correctly, um, that says language is like a toolkit. Um, if you know the meaning of the words, like one or nothing or add or few or in between or after more, I can answer a question. I have the knowledge of the meaning of these words in my toolkit. If I don't know the meaning of these words, I won't be able to answer a question. And unfortunately, we see that, that this is the case in South Africa and also in many other countries where children learn in a different language than, than their mother tongue. Um, they perform poorly on assessments because they don't know the meaning of the questions. So my motivation was children in South Africa consistently perform poorly on mathematics assessments. Early numeracy is the foundation for mathematics in primary school. And because mathematics concept develop hierarchy, poor performance in primary school mathematics influenced math in high school. And then also it influences adult life where um, adults have to apply for jobs. And we know that mathematics is required in a mathematics, mathematics filled society. So there are three examples of assessments on the screen where South African children performed very poorly. Um, in the 2015 TIM study, South Africa's grade five children participated in an assessment while the rest of the children in other countries were in grade four. And still our children um, was rated 48th out of 49 countries. This is quite concerning. And also a SACMEC study, study in 2010 found that only 5.5% of the grade sixes could complete single step addition and subtraction, um, which is only they only reached level one out of level out of eight levels, and only 5.9% of our grade sixes were mathematically skilled. So they defined mathematically skilled um, if a child reached level six out of eight levels. Um, and then also another study 
um, conducted by, by Nick Spall and Kotze in 2015, found that only 16% of grade three children in South Africa could actually perform at a grade three level. Um, so this is, this is the reason why we try to see how can we support children to learn mathematics more successfully. And as we know, we should form a foundation in the early grades, and that is why we start in the early grades, and they can't learn mathematics in the early grades if they don't know the words. So the objective of the study was to develop a tool to assess early grade children's mathematics-specific vocabulary. And this test was specifically developed to be used together with a second test called the Marco D. The Marco D assesses the children's knowledge of number concepts. So there should be an overlap between the construct assessment and the assessment of the vocabulary associated with these constructs. So in this slide, I show um, examples of this overlap. I, I mentioned earlier that the test is called, the, the language test is called the mathematics or the Meerkat Maps language test. And the Marco D is actually a German acronym that refers to mathematics constructs um, that's being assessed. And when we, when we developed the, the Marco D, we had to decide on characters that we could use in a storyline that was literally in, um, woven into the assessment, the Marco D assessment. And we settled for many reasons on a meerkat, which are little animals here in, in South Africa. They live mostly in the desert. And all right, so let's have a look at the overlap between these two assessments. If the Marco D assesses a construct like before in a question like what comes just before five, the MMLT construct will be before. I will show how we assess this in the next slides. When we ask what comes just after three, the construct or the vocabulary, the word that's being assessed in the MMLT is after, or what comes between two and four, which row has more, which row has less, what is one bigger than seven, and what is one smaller than five. So there is an overlap between these two assessments. The Marco D, is, was developed with five levels in mind. So when children learn mathematics, the, the literature tells us that they first learn to count, but they only learn this as a rhyme. Um, young children will say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and the parents will be so happy because they know the meaning of these words, but actually they just know the rhyme of counting. And then after a while, after a few years, they learn that there is a certain order to these words that they say. Two is always before three, and eight is always after seven. And after they come to realize this ordinality, they learn the principle of cardinality, where they um, realize that five is always five individual objects or we, I call it the fiveness of five, the manyness of a number. And when they are familiar with the cardinality principle, they learn that every number can be decomposed into smaller numbers. So eight can be five and three or four and four, but eight is always also part of larger numbers. So eight is also part of nine and 10 and so forth. And we call this concept the part, part, whole concept. And then they realize that, or they learn that there is a certain relationship between numbers. Four is two times two, or eight is a two, 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 and two. So there's a certain relationship between them. And these constructs um, are all supported by the vocabulary that is that's associated with these concepts. 
So how did I design this test? I identified numerical language qualifiers, comparative words and spatial words that I mentioned earlier in the Marco D. And then I designed items to include in the MMLT based on the Marco D, but also based on literature and while keeping our curriculum in mind as well. And it's important to mention that this test hasn't been validated in South Africa. We are currently collecting um, enough data to um, norm this test in, in South Africa. So this is an example of the questions. And that one question says, put your finger on the picture with more bugs. Or put your, another question says, put your finger on the tallest animal. So here's an, a, a photo or two of um, when we tested the children and um, where the child puts his finger on the picture with more bugs and the taller animal. So in conclusion, a mathematics specific vocabulary test should be included in baseline assessments in the early grades to establish which mathematics related vocabulary children know and which words they are yet to learn. If we can improve mathematics specific language, we could also improve um, children's numeracy learning, especially in schools with a multilingual population where children learn in English, which might not necessarily be the, a language with which they are familiar. Um, so the future directions is to gather enough data to norm the test in South Africa, and also to utilize this instrument in a research project where the marker D is also used. And then another um, exciting future direction for us at the Faculty of Education at UJ um, is neuroimaging projects where we can do some FNOS brain scans with young children to find out what is, um, which part of the brain is actually involved when vocabulary is when children encounter mathematics specific vocabulary and other constructs. Um, yes. And thank you very much for listening to this presentation. I will see um, perhaps um, if Elizabeth Henning can try, Albi, maybe you can try to share your screen now. And then she can present um, her part of the symposium as well. Okay, here I go. Um, <laughs> you can hear me, and if you want to, I can also let you see me. And if you then don't see my screen, I have actually discovered with the help of Alexis uh, what's happening here, and it's really not important because I only have four little slides, and some of the uh, items have already been addressed by Henry. So let me give it a go. And uh, we can multitask, so I can try it. And if it doesn't come up, then so be it, because uh, these slides are not terribly important. I can maybe show you just the last slide. I think it's not coming in, although I uh, went out of the meeting and back in, I didn't sign in again. So um, I'm, I'm saying now what I wanted to say on, you know, on the screen, on the screen sharing bit as well. You know, the University of Johannesburg is situated in this massive city with its many millions of people. And our campus where Henry and I and Kile and Ayanda work uh, is in Soweto. And if you know anything about our country's history, uh, history Soweto is a, a previously segregated area and still segregated in many ways. Uh, it was a an area called, uh, in South African jargon, a township, which means it was uh, an added part to the town or the city, and it was um, for people who were not of the white race. So with that history in mind, we've been trying in our country for very many years to make up for what we've lost, and it's very difficult. It's difficult on political, economic, social, all levels, but specifically with regard to education. And that's why we are doing this work supported by our university and also by the National Research Foundation where yours truly 
uh, 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 you know, I hold a chair, a research chair, but my research chair is basically run by the students and the postdocs. So I, I'm just a facilitator and I know my place quite well. And um, why we are so worried, as Henri has explained, about the issue of learning mathematics, early number and geometry and everything that comes after that in uh, such a mix of languages. Linguistically, it really doesn't always make sense. And that is basically the bottom line of what we are trying to do in various projects. Um, Fikilia Somelani, who will speak with you now, uh, is a lecturer at the university, but she has also at least 20 years of teaching maths in the early grades and also a teacher trainer a, a teacher trainer who works at the university and also in our lab school. And she will report on a, a study that she did about teachers who were involved in a really intense teacher development program for our partner schools. We have five and I think now six, seven partner schools in Soweto. And she studied the teachers implementation of what they had learned during this development program. And I think I should hand over to you now, Fikilia, are you ready? Yes, Prof, thank you very much. Okay, there you um, go. Okay. Let me share my screen, hope, um, okay. Can you, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Oh, great. Okay, let me show my face. Um, and then I will close again. How do I do that? Uh, Hi. You know, technology and its things. Okay, let me just um, say hello to everybody. This is me, Figile Similane. Um, as Prof has uh, introduced me, I'm one of the lecturers at the University of Johannesburg and also a PhD student under the supervision of Professor Yenin. And the study that I'm going to present, it will, it's a study that was also supervised by uh, Professor Yenning, but today I was focusing on uh, on mathematics. So yeah, let me share my screen so that I can start. Mm. Right. So the title of um, the study was "Early Great Teacher, Early Great Teachers." and children's difficulties with mathematics learning. At the time of the study, I was the head of department in foundation phase in um, our teaching school, you know, the university teaching school where Ayanda works. I knew that the FP or rather the foundation phase teachers were trained in the theory of mathematical cognition and that they knew enough about contemporary research in this field to guide them in their planning and practice. So when monitoring curriculum at that time, I noticed that most teachers followed their intuition first and then follow the rules of how to teach math without necessarily being aware of why they do so or why they do either. And then in our reflection discussion about their work, the teachers whom I worked with did not show much understanding of how children learn and how they develop the concept that underlie the, the number relationship. From the conversations and the observations that I had with the teachers, I became curious about what teachers know about children's general cognitive development and specifically their number concept development. My interest shifted to how teachers identify and assist those learners who are obviously learning with difficulties. 
So when I looked into literature, into literature some of the uh, mathematics specialists, um, they basically um, speak to the, the, the learning difficulties of young children. So they say that um, the learning difficulties in young children are more or rather, they agree that mathematics learning difficulties that are encountered in early grades and that are not addressed and remedied will persist throughout learner's school career. They also argue that later obstacles to learning math can be traced back to an earlier lack of number concept development as explicated in the current research study. So I was motivated to conduct, to conduct this study, not only because of my professional interest, but also because of the common knowledge that South African primary school mathematics educations, education failed the majority of young learners in South African school. So according to these um, uh, 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 authors, such as Kerry and, um, and Chin, they say that learners acquire learning deficit by default through the teaching they have received earlier on in their schooling career, and that this can create a backlog if not addressed. And we see that also in the past results. So this backlog may later be the root of the underperformance of most of our children. So the theoretical framework that I've used, I've approached the study from the content framework of literature on mathematical cognition, specifically number sense. This framework is a combination of current literature on cognitive developmental psychology by leading authors such as Kerry and Spelke and the others. I included the work of Diane and other authors who have investigated the idea of number sense neurocognitively, such as Bogdan and Ansari. Then from the angle of uh, teacher learning, I approached the study from Schulman's theorizing of type of teacher uh, knowledge. And then I also included a model of teacher professional development by Snow and, uh, and these other uh, authors, which I will explain. So according to the model of, um, of Snow, they claim that we've got different knowledges, you know, when it comes to the professional development of teachers. The first one is the declarative knowledge where teachers use what they have learned from the university, you know, or from any other workshop. So it's declarative. And then we put the second knowledge where now they proceed, like, you know, they get to be upgraded or, you know, their knowledge gets to be upgraded because of their experience and um, the fact that, you know, they now understand how to manipulate the tools that they are using for teaching. So that knowledge is then um, claimed or said to be a, situa a situated knowledge. Then there's a stable procedure. And then the last stage, it's what they call the expect um, adaptive knowledge where teachers can now reflect and organize uh, their knowledge, you know, and come up with new things and see how best they can integrate what they have learned, you know, in in-service training and so forth. So, <clears throat> Snow claims that it is imperative for teachers to have subject matter knowledge, knowledge of learners, the ability to engage learners in active learning, the ability to examine and learn from their own practice. Thus, teachers should have PCKs that include an understanding of how children learn, and they should be able to identify the specific problem which some learners may encounter. So this knowledge should go beyond just knowing, which is the declaring uh, or declarative knowledge which I've alluded to before and leads to doing in specific situation with specific children, thus being able to adapt their teaching in an expert way. So that is the ideal for a master teacher. So the master teacher, meaning that the teacher will now be at the last knowledge where now they can be able to reflect and analyze. So um, the aim of the study, it was to explore processes through which early grade teachers identify children's learning problem 
in mathematics, particularly in a teaching school, because these teachers, remember, I had indicated that they had attended the training. So my question was, how do early grade teachers identify children's learning difficulties in mathematics? The set object, the objectives um, were set to meet the aim were about, let me see, four, right? So the first one was to establish how teachers can use professional knowledge, such as the model of number conceptual development, which um, Henry spoke to, to identify children's numerical concept development and arithmetic. Uh, arithmetical competences. The second objective was to find out how teachers can utilize the new knowledge in their practice in order to identify learning challenges in mathematics. The third one what is to establish how teachers are integrating their new knowledge in their PC case during teaching in their classroom. And the last one, was to describe teachers' professional development according to the model Gaga Snow. So the design was a case study. And I, for collecting data, I used um, interviews, classroom of observation, as well as uh, document analysis. The purpose of interviews. It was to capture teachers' pre-intervention knowledge of mathematics learning and remedial learning support. And the purpose for observation, it was to look at the teacher's general pedagogical knowledge and also observe their specific pedagogical content knowledge with regards to identifying MLD, which is mathematical learning difficulties. I also wanted to establish how the teachers were maintaining the classroom discourse, right? Because that is very important, the discourse that the, uh, how they would maintain that for formative assessment, which I believe it is the central for support. So data was analyzed, was analyzed to identify, describe and explore the situation related to the research question, which I have alluded to. The unit of analysis was based on model of number concept development, as well as um, one of the teacher career uh, development. So a combination of grounded theory style um, was used, was utilized for the study. And um, I looked at uh, listening and speaking, I'm, I'm sorry, I looked at listening to recording, transcribe, and then I transcribed the interviews. I listened to um, the recording, uh, transcript uh, back and forth, and then I created cate uh, categories uh, thereafter. Then from the themes that were extracted, um, these are the themes that were ext extracted. Mm -hmm. Teachers were struggling to teach, and um, okay, I don't know why. Okay, please hold on. Um, I'm getting a call from Professor Yenning. I don't know if I'm audible or what. No, I was calling you quietly, Fikile, to say I think your time is up. Oh, okay. Thank you. That's, um, that, that's the way we work, dear colleagues from different parts of the world. We're very straight. Okay. All right. Thank then. you. So, I don't have to discuss the conclusion. So how did you, you find... just mention your, um, your main conclusion, Fakile? Okay. So, um, my conclusion was um, was that I came to the conclusion that despite um, their PCK development and growth, exp uh, the experienced teachers do not integrate the knowledge of number concept. Uh, and then, then the analysis of data of the study showed that teachers' knowledge of mathematical cognition theory has limitation when it comes to applying this knowledge in practice. 
And then it was also evidence that um, in this regard, teachers in the study have not yet uh, fine tuned their PCK and teaching concept um, conceptually and not only according to specific method. So yeah, let me just uh, close from there because it looks like I'm taking quite a lot of time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fakile. Um, let's hand over to Ayanda and Lamini, who is one of the teachers at the teaching school, and he will present his study that he conducted about word problems. Thank you, Ayanda. Okay, thank you, everybody. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay, uh, well, being as crusty as I am, and uh, having to hear everybody talking about me being at the teaching school, where I'm still right there. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping that everyone can see me. Um, I am Ayanda, ladies and gentlemen. I will try and close down my camera now because, yeah, I'm still as tired as I am from the day, the long day of work from today. Okay, um, if I can share my screen. Um, let me do so now. Um, hoping that it is visible to everyone. Yes, thank you, Ayanda. We can see your screen. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, um, colleagues. My presentation will be more around uh, the solving of grade problems in grade three, focusing on the linguistic perspective of you know, grade three learners reading and solving of mathematical problems. Um, as the study was, um, or the study is still being supervised by Professor Elizabeth Yenning, and I think all of us here know her very well <laughs> from my colleagues as well. Um, and by with the help of um, Dr. Rita Niemi as well from the University of Helsinki, so I will not fail to mention her. She made a very big contribution into this particular study. Um, moving forward, uh, this is a basic overview. Mine is quite conventional, the conventional way of uh, doing such a presentation. When I thought about it, I thought about something that goes as follows. I'll be looking at the introduction and the background of the study. I'll be focusing on the research question and the motivation as to why the study was, uh, was done, the aims and the objectives that underpin the study how the data was collected, the methods that were used to collect the data, sampling and um, data analysis and my findings together with my conclusion. I will try as be brief as I can possibly can or I can possibly be. Um, as we all know that, um, you know, wet problems across different countries, different places has been the biggest problem and we are no stranger to this in our South African context. Um, young children at the time that they they start with their word problems they start that at the time that they start to read word problems especially uh, specifically with me in grade three young children have to do a lot and this is a massive task that children have to undertake in terms uh, for them to be able to to solve uh, word problems they they encountered with trying to read the problem and trying to make meaning of it trying to try and deduce meaning from the problem, as I've stated here, that they have to also process the lexicon that make meaning. And this is a very tough task for children to do. And after reading all of this, they, they then encountered with, you know, the task of doing calculations and being able to calculate the, the different um, uh, word problems that they encounter or the numerical things that they see in front of them. So, this really intrigued my focus and really made me want to know and understand exactly why do kids have this big massive challenge and upon looking at different research and different things that people might have written about the topic i found that alphabets were just symbols symbols that were that kids had to look at and if they had the phonemic awareness or the phonemic knowledge for them to be able to decode the symbols to make meaning from them they still have to encounter the calculations that, that still have to happen. And this process is, is extremely difficult and is impactful upon the, them being able to uh, actually successfully answer these with problems. And um, it, what I found is that with kids, they only see an image, especially when they're reading something from a page. 
they see an image, they see symbols, and all of that is transferred into the visual cortex or the visual cortex from, from where there's input that is sent to uh, different areas of the brain to process that verbal and to make meaning of it. And this process happens in, in milliseconds. It happens very quickly. And what I found is that calculations can only begin if all the words and the syntax is clear and the kid or the child is able to read fluently. And if the child is unable to read, then that's where the problem starts. The challenge becomes reading before they can even perform the mathematical operations. Uh, moving on to the research question. Um, this study basically is just underpinned by the following research question. I wanted to look at or what I asked myself was basically how do language proficiency and reading competency feature in grade three learners uh, solving of word problems. So the reason why I decided to do this particular topic as I've already alluded to that, and as well as Henry has already mentioned and Prof Henning, that I'm, I'm, I'm a teacher at the, the lab school, the lab school that the university had. And as a reflective practitioner, I acknowledge that my teaching practice needed to advance and I decided to undertake this, uh, to undertake the study for me to be able to try as, as best as I can to understand the challenges that learners face when it comes to web problems and try and address this with um, my class and trying to see how best I can probably teach these particular web problems. And I, uh, I devise a customized test, if I can call it that, or a short narrative of about 10 questions that was used for me to be able to assess maybe the learners, um, you know, performance in terms of word problems and how they would do in a single um, structure, in a single structure of a story that followed, that was followed by questions that kids needed to refer to the story for them to be able to, to answer those particular questions. Um, the aim of the study is obviously was to just examine, as I've already said that I was looking at the linguistic uh, perspective, was already to examine the linguistical factors that come into play when grade three uh, learners engage with verbally formulated uh, mathematical word problems. And then the objectives of the study using the uh, test that I had devised was to basically capture the performance of the, the group of those grade three learners, how well did they do? And then from there, it was to then create a sample or take a few learners from that particular group of learners to then interview them in clinical task-based interviews, which Piaget introduced in the 1980s somewhere there. And, um, you know, some of the things that I wanted to check or some of the things that I wanted to see include language proficiency, reading competency and the arithmetic knowledge that kids have in terms of trying to uh, work with word problems. And I followed the study obviously follows the ideologies of the practitioner research, which is underpinned by the following, uh, just intentional research into one's own practice as a teacher myself, uh, the primary aim of improving my own practice in the classroom and uh, an author uh, different authors, but I cited one in this instance that Campbell and Groundwater Smith uh, describe this particular ideology or this particular uh, design as a, a tool that is powerful to, to try and be a better version of yourself and also just to be reflective as we all should be. And the analysis of, you know, practitioner research are very descriptive and they put things into context which essentially, you know, you make meaning from them. And then uh, following that, uh, the methods that I used to collect data from the study, I used observations. These were minor observations that I, I did during the classrooms when I, was, when I was teaching with problems. And some of the observations that I, I also gathered from the interviews that I conducted with them. And uh, the custom made test problem uh, or the custom made word problem test that I spoke about that um, test was just to assess the performance of the learners, as I've said, uh, and we had about 56 participants, which I'll talk about in the next slide. And then I also had the task-based clinical interviews that I did with them after I had 
collected the data or after we had written the tests. And then, um, yes, uh, the sampling of the study, basically the sampling of the study was purposeful and the participants were essentially grade three learners. Uh, the grade three learners consisted of two classes. We had class A, which had about 26 learners, and then class B had about 30 learners. And uh, the total number of the learners that took part in the study were 56. And then these learners also took part in the uh, interviews. As I said, it was a stratified sample, a subsample of the learners that took part in the test. So I selected three learners from the results that I got from the test itself. I selected three learners that were under the group of unsatisfactory performance. I selected another three learners from the satisfactory performance and the three, the other three from the outstanding performance. So basically unsatisfactory performance means that the kids or the, the learners got below 47% in the test and then satisfactory uh, performance the, uh, ranges from 48% to 79%. And then outstanding performance uh, are all the learners that were above 80%. And then the data was basically, uh, the data obtained from these instruments were transcribed and organized into various codes that were placed into different categories to formulate prominent themes. Uh, correlation between the final themes and the studies research question and objective was done obviously to check consistency. Okay, uh, this is an exit from the analysis. This is an example from the some of the interviews that I had with the kids and one of the responses that I got or how I got to the theme that I came up with. Uh, so one child said, say, I don't understand what the sentence is saying. So basically the child could not understand the sentence. And I categorized that into the child is unable to understand, unable to make meaning of what the sentence is saying, which is more of a linguistic problem, which is a linguistic complexity that we have in within the study. Uh, and then looking into the findings, uh, some of the findings that came out of the study, this is the basic um, test that they wrote, the customized test. Uh, I don't know if it would have been nice, but I think it would have been quite well or quite good to actually show the test, how the test looked. But I think we can do that uh, later if we do have time. But this is the, the, um, the results that I found from the test. I found that 52% of the learners performed under the, under, under the unsatisfactory performance, as I've already mentioned, that these learners got below 70 or 47 percent and then another 34 percent of these of the 56 learners performed under the the, the umbrella of satisfactory performance and then another 14 percent of the learners uh, performed under the the outstanding performance uh, umbrella that i had so just looking at this particular pie chart you can already see that it is, uh, it is alarming that most of the learners performed below the unsatisfactory level, which is something that is quite known already. But I wanted to delve deep into why exactly do we have such a big amount or such a big number of learners performing so poorly in terms of these word problems. Then these are some of the findings that I found is that uh, these learners, they struggled a lot with some of the questions and these questions themselves were just varied in, in terms of the approach. They didn't, there are questions that required situational analysis just to look at the story, uh, see exactly, you know, apply the common sense, apply the basic knowledge of understanding. And then there were some questions that uh, actually required arithmetic thinking for them to be able to look at the story, deduce meaning, and then try and put numbers into the words and, and do the maths. So, the results show that learners struggled more with these questions that required arithmetic thinking as compared to questions that required situational analysis. And the reasons for these were due to reading, you know, reading uh, competency, the lack of reading competency, the lack of numerical complexity, uh, linguistic complexity, and working problem overload, and which this uh, working problem, uh, or working memory rather, was the biggest founding uh, that I. Uh, uncovered or that I got from the interviews that I, I conducted then after that. And then looking at the, at the interviews, I think much of the activity that took place, as I've already mentioned first, that 
it, it happens in milliseconds. And all of those kids have to try and understand and try and make meaning and everything. And they just resorted based on the interviews that I did with them. You could see that kids just resorted to doing, uh, to just understanding, looking at the story, looking at the question and just picking out a word that says all together. Then they would then assume that all together means that they must add. And then they, they, must, they will assume that if they find something that says how many are left, then they will assume that they're just supposed to subtract. And you know, I also found that long sentences as well that had more than one subclause, you know, made the matters or made matters worse because it would then confuse the learners and then meaning would be thrown out the window in terms of that. And then uh, vocabulary as well was quite a, a big uh, issue as well. Kids could not understand some of the words that they saw from the from the tags. And then you know, you found that. Uh, I also found that it, 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 the story itself, because it was a single um, storyline that did not change in terms of characters. The characters remained the same and kids were able to then refer back to the story and they were able to understand exactly what the question is asking them. The problem became that some of them couldn't read, some of them couldn't understand, some of them even did the maths wrong, which I'll try and um, speak to in the next slide. Um, and then just interpreting the data, um, children's working memory was challenged by having to briefly store information while making executive decisions about steps in solving the problems. You know, uh, which information was to inhibit, which information will they use? And, you know, I argue in the study that reading a second language while having to strategize and calculate leads to a collision in exercising executive functions. Not only is working memory compromised, but the ability to shift information while other information is interpreted is not easy. It's not an easy task, and we all know that. Attention was focused more in interpreting the information and making decisions on what to do, while temporary stored information was lost. You know, so these are most of the things that I found from the study. And it was surprising to me to find that uh, the last point that I've jotted down there was surprising, um, the double checking. You find that kids understood the question, they understood what they're supposed to do in terms of the, the calculations, but trying to uh, answer the question, they, they were hasty in it and some of them were hurrying and then they, they didn't double check the answer and you find that you ask them, why did you do it like this? And the child would say, oh, that I, I, no, I didn't mean to do it like this. I meant to do it like this. So you could see that just double checking, giving yourself that two seconds to double check would make things much easier and trying to um, you know, get or improve the data. We would then classify them as you know, kids struggle in this, but just that more time for them to actually, or maybe we can encourage them to try and double check their answer. Uh, in conclusion, language proficiency and reading competency play an important role in the process of solving with problems, you know? And um, mathematical word problems, which require multiple names and objects uh, and activities may be solved easily by trying to make a sure. with a single reading passage, which is coherent in the plot, like I did with uh, the single storyline that they had. Such a plot can contain a variety of problems which can require arithmetic competence. The advantage of all of this is that the extraneous information about people, the names, the object, and the setting, and so forth will not be an obstacle and clutter the memory. And then I argue that it may also release the tension of the executive function, which causes anxiety in learners. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for listening. And I hope I stick or I stuck to time. Thank you, Ayanda. Thank you very much for your presentation and also to Profenang and um, Fikile Samelane. Um, Alexa, I'm not sure if we have time for um, questions. Um, otherwise, I will just provide my email address in the chat. Um, and please feel free to um, send an email with questions. Yeah. Yep, that would be great. It looks like there's one in the chat if you want to answer it really quickly. Um, yes. right. And see my email address. Um, I see there is a question. Um, is it possible for teachers to leverage or assess children's foundation number knowledge in their home language in addition to English? 
I'm particularly interested in reception, but maybe relevant on, um, later on too. Um, I think, um, I'm not sure if this was addressed to someone specific, but I will quickly um, answer this question. In, in South Africa or in the school where we conducted most of the research, the, um, the, the foundation phase from grade one onwards, the children learn in English. But in the kindergarten or in reception here, they learn in their home language. Um, so the children are assessed in both their home language and in English in the reception year. And then from grade one onwards, only in English. But there is a lot of code switching that goes on in, in the teaching, not so much during the assessment, but, um, but in, in teaching, yes. And this is not a... a the model that is followed by all the schools in South Africa. It's, main, it's followed in some schools. Um, in other schools, the children only transfer to English as medium um, of instruction, um, perhaps in grade two or, or sometimes in grade three or even onwards. It depends on the school. I hope that answered the question. Are there any other questions? I think that was great. Thank you so much, Henry, for organizing such a great symposium. Um, and you did drop your email in there, right? So if anyone has any other questions, feel free to reach out to her. Um, and thank you guys for joining. Hopefully we'll see a lot of you uh, next Friday for our next meeting. And have a great rest of your week, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.